Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and in today's video we're going to be talking about Trappist 1 yet again, but specifically we're actually going to be talking about the idea of the tidal lock, and specifically how is it that we are absolutely certain that every single one of these Trappist planets is actually tidally locked to the parent star. Let's actually find out using this video, and today you're going to learn something new. Welcome to What The Math. <laughs> So, with the 2017 discovery of TRAPPIST-1 system and its seven Earth-like planets, people started to basically um, be fascinated by the idea of these being Earth-like planets with essentially similar composition and similar structure to Earth. But of course, that is not the truth, because every single one of these seven planets is very, very likely, almost 99% certain, uh, tidally locked to their parent star. In other words, the side that's facing the sun is going to be very hot. The side that's facing away from the sun or the star is going to be very, very cold. And then only right here on the twilight area, the so-called twilight zone, is where you might find some liquid water and possibly, just possibly, potentially some life. Now, so why exactly do we know that this happens and why exactly does this happen? So let's actually discuss this using something a little bit more familiar to us. Specifically, we're going to be looking at the system of Jupiter. And so here we are um, around Jupiter with all of its moons orbiting around it. There's quite a lot of them, but the ones we'll be looking at are only the moons that basically have been with Jupiter for a very, very long time. Specifically, of course, the so-called Galilean moons, uh, Io, Ganymede, Europa, and where are you? Where is the, where's the other one? Callisto, there you go. So these four moons, they have been with Jupiter for a very, very long time. And these are the moons that um, essentially have been here since the creation. Now, why only these moons? Well, because it's these moons that we actually um, are going to use to simulate the tidal lock and, of course, to try to understand how tidal locking occurs. So, let's just look at Io. Io is the closest, and as you can see, it is also tidally locked to Jupiter. So, I'm going to show you that it's always the same side of Io that's going to be facing away from it. So, look at this spot right here. You'll notice that it's always facing away from Jupiter. Every single moon of Jupiter has that. If, you, if I go to Europa, it will have the same thing. It's always the same spot that's going to be facing Jupiter, for example. So let's uh, let's just maybe uh, do it from this angle right here. And you'll notice that as we're um, orbiting around Jupiter, it's actually the same side that's always facing Jupiter. And there's another way to, of checking these uh, by going under motion and looking at the rotation period and then comparing it to the orbital period, which is somewhere right here. And you'll see that it's exactly the same number or almost the same number in this case, because I think it might have changed just a little bit um, due to the simulation constraints here. So Ganymede has the same, of course. And here we have 715 days rotation period and 716 orbital period. And lastly, um, Callisto, which is the farthest away, away from Jupiter, has uh, the same parameters. So it's 16.7 rotational period and 16.7 um, orbital period. Unfortunately, Callisto, though, is kind of invisible right now. I don't know why it's hard to see, but the um, I'm guessing it's because the sign is not, is, sun is not present here. But we don't really need Callisto for this experiment, so let's just focus on Io, Ganymede, and Europa. So, what exactly is tidal locking and how does it occur? Well, tidal locking is also known as gravitational locking, and it occurs um, over the course of an orbit, usually over a period of a long time, and essentially what it does is uh, it reduces the uh, transfer of angular momentum between two objects. When two objects are spinning, they create a bit of a momentum. But over time, between two astronomical bodies, uh, the gravitational partner of one um, object will try to neutralize this uh, momentum and essentially cause two objects to start orbiting um, as fast as they're rotating. So, for example, if I were to place, let's just say Mercury right here, it would not be gravitationally locked or it would, it would not be tidally locked to uh, Jupiter. So, right now, it's experiencing a little bit less tidal stress on uh, the outer side than it does on the inner side. 
this gravitational stress is usually caused by the um, the torque force or by basically torque applied by the gravity of Jupiter in this case to the gravitational or tidal bulges created um, on on the second object. So it's uh, essentially represented really well in the picture right here where you can see that what uh, happens over time is that the tidal forces try to align with the bulge here and basically we're trying to neutralize the forces caused by uh, the tidal effects. Now, we know for a fact that this is exactly what happened to our moon. So over time, after the creation of the moon, our moon essentially neutralized the um, tidal effects that were caused uh, to it by Earth and became tidally locked to our planet Earth, um, essentially always facing the same direction. Earth, on the other hand, slowed down over time. So our day used to be much, much longer. As a matter of fact, um, when the Earth was just created, our day was about six hours long. Now it's 24 hours long. So the Earth slowed down about four times and eventually it will also become tidally locked to the moon. It just will take several billion years. Um, but, you know, by then Earth will very likely disappear due to the uh, expansion of our star, the sun. But that's another story. Anyway, so tidal locks um, happen quite often and quite a lot. One of the more common objects that has a dual tidal lock is actually Pluto and Charon. And so in case of uh, Pluto and Charon, you can see that they're actually tidally locked to each other. And that's mostly because their masses are relatively similar and they're relatively close to each other. But when one object is much uh, more massive than the other, a um, smaller object will be tidally locked, but the larger object usually will not be tidally locked. So this is one of the reasons why in case of Jupiter, Saturn and other large planets, uh, their satellites are tidally locked, but uh, the planets themselves are not tidally lo locked to anything. So, from this, what can we actually speculate? Well, first of all, let's just say we multiply um, the system of Jupiter, in terms of mass at least, by about 80 times. In other words, we're going to turn Jupiter into similar mass object to um, TRAPPIST-1. So it's going to become 80, approximately 80 masses of Jupiter and and right away, it actually turns into some sort of a super cool dwarf star. Now, let's actually position these objects so that they actually start orbiting around um, our new Jupiter. And we really are only going to keep uh, the four Galilean moons. Everything else can just kind of fall into Jupiter and disappear. Now, let's actually also change their mass as well, multiplying it by about 80 times. So, uh, they will essentially turn into planets of this newly formed star, the Jupiter, or this really, really cool dark dwarf star called Jupiter. Uh, also, we might as well give it a little bit more temperature than that because it's currently a little bit too cold here. The current temperature of this uh, object is only 122 Kelvin. The reality is that it's about 2200 Kelvin. So there we go. And I think this might actually start burning some of our planets. That's not good. But anyway, so um, let's start with Io. Io is going to place at a slightly um, farther away distance from this uh, the star, mostly because otherwise it's going to get destroyed pretty quickly by tidal forces. I'm going to place Io at about 0 0.01 astronomical units from the star, which is uh, going to be uh, the orbital period of about 1.5 days. So it's just a little bit farther away from when it, where it used to be, uh, and, and basically uh, even closer than the orbit of Callisto. Uh, so all of the other objects will basically kind of get very similar parameters here. This will be orbiting around two days and the other ones at around two, four, and let's just say eight days. So there's our new system. Let's also give them a little bit more mass just to make them more planetary like. So let's actually just multiply their mass by about a factor of 80 as well, just to make this a little bit more realistic. So this here will become about half the mass of Earth. This here will become just a little bit over a half mass of Earth, and the other objects will become even a little bit more massive. So this is a one and a half masses of Earth, and this here will be about um, two masses of Earth. So as you can see, multiplying all of this by about 80 will create something very, very similar to the system of TRAPPIST. Um, the distances don't have to change very much, but the idea here is that the ratio between mass of Jupiter and mass of its original satellites is very, very similar to the mass of TRAPPIST-1 and uh, TRAPPIST planets. 
So the effects that uh, Jupiter causes on its moons is actually very similar to the effects that we would expect Trappist-1 star to cause on its planets. Uh, so those planets will actually receive exactly the same tidal effects or very, very similar tidal effects um, as the moons of Jupiter uh, get from Jupiter. So of course this implies one thing and the implication here is that the model for Trappist is essentially in our own solar system and that's of course Jupiter that I've just created here. So that model is a pretty good indication that all of these planets, all of the Trappist planets will be similarly locked to, to Trappist itself just in the same way that if I were to go back to Jupiter here, in the same way that all of these moons including Io, Ganymede, Callisto and Europa are locked to uh, Jupiter. So here the same side always faces the um, the gas giant. If I go to Saturn, for example, even the farthest moon, Titan, is going to still be tidally locked. So here, even though it's kind of hard to see what side is facing what because Titan Titan's surface is very difficult to see, we can actually go in here and remove all of this. We can actually go under motion here and um, look at the actual number. So rotational period is 15.9 days and the orbital period is also 15.9 days, implying that this uh, moon is also tidally locked to Saturn. So all of the major moons around gas giants and around um, ice giants, as long as they started there from scratch, from the beginning, from the formation of the system, essentially are tidally locked. Uh, the only few giant, uh, the only few moons that are not tidally locked are, for example, uh, Neptune has this moon called Triton that seems to orbit against the flow and is not tidally locked because it's doing its own thing. And that's because we think that Triton was long ago captured as a passing rogue dwarf planet by Neptune. And we also are pretty sure that through interaction uh, of tidal forces, it will one day collide with Neptune and will very likely disappear from existence. And so all of this hopefully gave you a pretty good idea that um, in, in general, we are very, very certain that Trappist planets are tidally locked to Trappist-1. And this also applies to other red dwarf um, systems that we've discovered, including the infamous Proxima B right here, where we are almost 100% certain that Proxima B is also tidally locked to Proxima Centauri. So all of these planets orbiting uh, around um, red dwarfs or super cool dwarfs or any small stars like Proxima Centauri or any of the other stars around our sun that are red dwarfs, uh, like for example this one right here, LHS 3003, this one right here, Wolf 1061, um, we, we're pretty sure they have planets around them, but those planets will very likely also be tidally locked, including, of course, the planets of Barnard Star, one of the earliest stars we've discovered that were actually a red dwarf. And so anyway, so that's all I wanted to talk about in this video, and hopefully you learned something from it, and hopefully now you know why we're certain that Trappist planets are uh, tidally locked and what it actually means uh, to us later on and how we can actually use our own solar system to model all of these tidal locks uh, by using systems like Jupiter and Saturn and looking at them in a little bit more detail and trying to figure out what exactly we can learn from the interaction of Jupiter and its moons and can then compare them to uh, smaller stars like brown dwarfs and red dwarfs as well. And anyway, thank you so much for watching. Please consider supporting the channel on Patreon and also subscribe if you still haven't. Come back here tomorrow to learn something else, something that you may have not known and something that might actually teach you something really cool. I'll see you guys later. Space out. And this time, let's actually go ahead and bombard Jupiter with all of its moons, creating a bit of a havoc on its surface. This will actually very likely cause Jupiter to have a lot of dark spots everywhere. And look at that. As soon as you collide something with Jupiter, it actually creates this really interesting effect in its atmosphere. That is pretty awesome. Let's get some more going. And here comes Callisto, and look at that explosion. Awesome. Anyway, I'll see you guys later. Space out. And as always, bye-bye.